Hi. I love eating tacos, chocolate, and pizza. Welcome to the Founder Hour. Hi, my name is Despo, and I like unicorns. Welcome to the Founder Hour. Nice. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to the Founder Hour podcast. I'm your co-host, Posh. I'm Pat. He's Pat. We have one microphone today because we have two wonderful guests. The first husband and wife team to be on the podcast at the same time, Woo-hoo. Mark and Ashley Merrill. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for uh, having us. Thank you. Of course. As you guys know, Mark is the co-founder of Riot Games, League of Legends. Ashley is the founder of Lunia. Uh, and I know you guys have a lot of new, exciting announcements to talk about and make and discuss with us. So we can't wait to get into it. And we're also interested to kind of hear about how that dynamic works in terms of both of these power players and business people. I think there's a lot of you know folks out there that are interested to see how that works out as they're going through their relationships too. So uh, welcome back. And I guess we'll start kicking it off with you, Mark. Tell us a little bit about what's going on with Riot Games and what's happened since we last spoke. Sure. So uh, we've, we've had a busy couple of years, um, but I would say that the, the most exciting update was um, you know, we just had the League of Legends 10-year anniversary, and we just celebrated with our community. I saw that Netflix documentary. Or was it on Netflix? Yeah. So League of Legends really Origins good. is a documentary that released in conjunction with the 10-year anniversary, uh, and we did a number of global events simultaneously uh, where we had you know, essentially millions of people around the world all celebrating um, and sort of watching a live broadcast, uh, you know, literally in 19 languages all around the world, where we went through some of the history of League of Legends and, you know, tried to pay homage to our players and, you know, the community. Pretty tough to create some videos to capture all the different things that have happened in, you know, over 10 years and in, in like some five minute segments. But I think, you know, the event went really well. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that was really exciting was then we surprised, uh, you know, our audience and I think a lot of people by, announcing a lot of our pipeline. And so we announced a card game, which is about to go into open beta called Legends of Runeterra. We announced an animated, uh, you know, series that's going to be coming out that we call Arcane. We announced a variety of other games, including League of Legends Wild Rift, uh, Project L, which is a fighting game, um, Project F, which uh, we've only teased a little bit, and then also... uh, Project A, which is a tactical shooter, and um, you know the internet lost their minds for a little bit. You know, rioters had a had a great time, and you know it's been it's been really exciting. And so, because finally, you know the the S in Riot Games is no longer becoming aspirational; it's becoming a reality. Yeah. And so, you know, it's always an exciting time as a developer. I mean, you've been working on something for a long period of time, and it's finally starting to see the light of day, and people are starting to give feedback, and, and the response this, has been great. Yeah, and, and ha- have all these projects been things that, like, you guys as a company have been working on for a long time and now are finally kind of releasing all at the same time, or was it just kind of, uh, like, more recently you, you guys were just like, all right, we got to start doing other things, and I'm sure, like, there's a lot of work that goes into making a new game, obviously. For sure. <laughs> but, like, but more so, like, <laughs> yeah. was it, like, how long have you been working on all these? Years. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's been interesting because we always felt this weird trade-off where we didn't want to sort of rob from Peter to pay Paul by stealing resources or continue to take people off of League of Legends, you know, because developers are the most critical and valuable resource we have to work on other games because there were so many things that our community still needed, so many bugs and features we wanted to add and problems. And uh, so we, fig- we ha- this is one of the reasons we had to grow the company and continue to scale the organization was to try to go create and incubate teams to go create these other incredible games that we knew we wanted to go, you know, create. And so um, almost all of these projects have been something that we've been working on for years. Sometimes we've thrown away or iterated greatly on internal prototypes and things that weren't working. Um, but a lot of these products have sort of survived the gauntlet, of course, and, uh, you know, are now in the light of day, which is really exciting. Mark, how is life differently now, I guess, at Riot? As, you know, you're still CEO, but how is life differently? Like in terms of leading the company after, you know, getting that, what was it, an acquisition at that time? Or was it more so like an investment? So, so one, yeah, so I'm no longer CEO. So, so chairman? 
Yeah, so uh, my business partner, Brandon, and I, uh, we stepped down. We were, we were co-founders, co-CEOs mm -hmm. for, for 12 years. And in January of 2018, we stepped down, elevated internal leadership team. Uh, the new CEO of Riot is the guy who used to run international business for us named Niccolo Laurent. He's doing an excellent job. And um, he's been at Riot for 10 years. And so uh, we are co-chairmen and co-founders. And so it's kind of this interesting dual role where on the one at around you know being chairman, one of the most important things we can do is hire the leadership team, mm -hmm. right? And sort of manage sort of the board from sort of a governance perspective. And uh, but then from a co-founder perspective, when we're operating within the business, we're actually accountable to Niccolo. So even though he's accountable to us from the board dynamic, right. when you know, like I led uh, along with a, an incredible team and along with my chief of staff, uh, Sarah Schutz, the you know the, the League of Legends tenure event and you know a lot of our products and you know all the announcements um, that we we're talking about. And you know, in that context, again, I'm reporting to Niccolo, which has been you know a great dynamic because we we have a great working relationship, and so um, so that's really been interesting. But uh, one of the best aspects of this is I have more flexibility now than I've ever had for the first time, you know, because it's been a grind. I'm sure uh, Ashley likes that totally. Well, and it's been important, and that like our relationship is a big part of the reason behind the shift as well, and. You know, it's she is in the midst of growing her business, and you know she's done an excellent job supporting me throughout the years. And you know, um, it was important to try to reallocate focus to spend more time with family and and with her and supporting her. And so, anyway, that's something we can talk about more too. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm curious, like just to dive into it. But was that a difficult transition for you? I mean, was it something that you both discussed? Or I mean, I, actually, I'm curious about your perspective. <laughs> Um, well, this how did, a, how, yeah, how this did that come up? Topic. I mean, I guess we're going deep from the get-go, so, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely these are the kinds of things we're discussing. So um, it's, a, it's a huge life change. And, I mean, I will say, even though that transition has largely, largely been made, uh, we're still unpacking what is, this, what is this new world for us? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a shift in dynamics, you know, where... Uh, if you go from being sort of the support person and now he's going to play a bit of a more support role. Uh, and and then, you know, we've just been in a grind mentality. We were just looking back because, you know, you've, you've got a close of a decade. So we were talking about what was this, what did this decade mean to us? And the word grind just, just both of us came right up, you know, um, and both in terms of our businesses uh, and in terms of our personal life. You know, we had very young kids in that in that period while trying mm -hmm. to, to uh, run businesses. So I think what we're hoping in this transition is that, you know, and we're, I guess we're shooting for that idealistic outcome that everybody wants, which is can we... Uh, maintain something that we have a lot of passion for, which is our businesses we've spent a long time building, uh, but not have to give so much of ourselves to that where we have nothing left for each other and the kids. So this is sort of like, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> well, and to that point, I think one of the things that's been challenging with the transition has been, you know, as a founder, you know, companies are often you know, akin to your children, right? right. Where you, they, they reflect you in so many personal ways and you pour so much of your heart and soul into it and whatnot. And so, you know, I've always struggled to not take things personally at the company. And, you know, I think getting more distance has helped me realize how attached I was. I think sometimes to the detriment of the business, interesting enough, where it's like on the scale meter if there's a, you know, or the care scale meter on the scale of one to 10, you know, I joked that I was probably a 13 yeah. of sort of caring too much about a lot of things. It probably didn't matter enough to warrant the type of reaction I might have or whatnot. A little bit of a high achievement perfectionist streak there on certain things. But but also for you guys, like it wasn't you didn't just build a company, like you built a massive community of, of all these gamers that like were so invested in this world that you created. So it's kind of like you I'm sure you felt this obligation to be there, uh, you know, where where it's it's a hard, you know, pull to to be present in your your personal life and even in your business, like at Riot Games and then also being a part of this community where you're there for them, right? Well, I think you're right on where literally ever since launching League, every single day I have felt the pain, and I'm sure this is true for many founders and whatnot, and probably many leaders, the trade-off, like the daily opportunity cost of all the things I could and should be doing to serve or support, you know, Riot employees more or League of Legends players more or my family more or my wife more or whatnot. And 
life is just an entire balancing act. And so, you know, it like for a long period of time, I've always felt like I'm letting somebody down by not doing the best thing I possibly could. And so, you know, getting really good at prioritization and time allocation and, um, trying to leverage your time really effectively has been something that, you know, really worked yeah. on. And I feel like there isn't a perfect like, um, mix, I guess, or like perfect way to prioritize, but I guess what have you learned the most from that in terms of how to prioritize all these different things? Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a couple things. So one is whenever you can combine activities to check multiple boxes, um, with the same unit of time, that's a great win. So as an example, if you're like, I need to recover because I'm exhausted and I want to be a good leader and so I need some personal recovery time or to go think strategically or whatnot, it's like, all right, maybe I need to go on vacation. All right, well, can I do that with my family, of course, because um, then we can get family time and what does that look like? And can I, it's like, how do I plan it? So as an example, like we did our personal 10 year anniversary with that Ash and I just celebrated which was right around the League of Legends 10-year anniversary because we actually got married right when it launched, which was not the plan originally. Well, you guys both I had very super, I was super pumped about that. You can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys had both very unplanned launches with both of your companies. Right. right. That's right. Yeah. 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 I well, guess that's so, the way to do it. Yeah. League, League was <laughs> yeah. Don't very plan. late. Yeah. And so we like tried to schedule the wedding way after we thought it'd come yeah. out. Yeah. To be safe. And then, of course, it landed literally like right. <laughs> I was on like, the, the only thing I want for the wedding is just that, like, this game is done. I don't want you to be stressing about it. Yeah. Literally, it was like they all landed right on top of How each other. How old were you like, guys back then? So it's been 10 years. So I'm 35. I was 25. Yeah. So you were 29. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm you, turning 40 this year. This is a big year. Did Ooh. you guys know in that moment that, or at least actually, I'm curious, in that moment, did you know or did you have any idea that this was going to take? What was going to be oh my your future gosh. husband's time away from you? So, so we have a joke at our house. Um, it's two weeks, two weeks. So I would say, but when are we going to go on a date? Or like, when am I going to get some of your time? Because early on, my career was less demanding, and I was playing more support role and being like, you know, kind of. I felt like a bit like I was waiting around for him because um, I was young. You know, yeah. I, we were married when I was twenty-five, so I was twenty-three. I want to go on a date. I want to do something. And and he'd be like. Just two weeks. Just it's just gonna be two more crazy weeks. And and then it's gonna be so much better. Anyway, just gotta get through this thing. I just want you thing. to know two weeks turned into twelve years, and here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And so now it is finally starting to happen. I, I do wanna jump in on one thing you said earlier though, which was um, well, I, do, I do wanna finish the, the quick thing where we celebrated our ten year anniversary. Oh, okay. We, so like because that's a recent example. In November this past year, we went to New York mm -hmm. where we both had to go do some media and do some work there and do some meetings. And then we went to Paris, which we both had to do work there also. And so what was cool is we both got to combine a trip we had to do for work with a trip we could share together, which was actually really cool. So we got to go see you know, world, the world championships. So we you know, we were in New York Paris for two days and Paris for a day and a half. Yeah. And that was our anniversary. Yeah. Right. Yeehaw. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Fine. Yeah. But again, that's an example right. of trying to combine the time right. with other meaningful things. And it actually, it was great. I'm curious about the two week thing though. Like just to kind of get into it, was it just like you were just saying two weeks or was, is that how you kind of like literally early on two weeks ahead? I was like, the reason that we're so crushed is because of all these short term things. Yeah. And so, you know, I was like, I need to get this done. I need to get this done. I need to get this done. The thing that I continued to underestimate was there were always new things yeah. that also were just right. as urgent and just as important. And it was infinite. Well, and the, yeah, the, the positive of a growing business is that it's a growing business. The downside is then the problems never stop coming. You're, you're always just getting over the hump, you mm. know, or just trying to get over the hump. Um, and so I think neither of us could have anticipated that, you know, this was going to be the kind of thing. You, you, first of all, we never anticipated the kind of success League had. Um, and so the the scaling at that speed is also not something that you know we could have planned for and it's a blessing yeah. but it's a it's a real and, thing and to be able to step out of that was it like you had to go cold turkey or, or or over time as the business scaled were you able to like take more and more time to for yourself and not have to be in, in the weeds as much uh well i do think that in order to lead a, a fast growing company effectively you need to be great at replacing yourself and um, so, uh, you know, and, but that's not just true for, you know, the CEO role. It's true for, I think, any C-level position or any even senior director position or VP or whatnot. 
um, like all of our department heads, because like, everybody's job essentially gets twice as complex every six months because you're adding, you know, we went from 60 people to 600 in a year. Yes. And, and so, and with a culture that is really nuanced where we operate in a way that was very different philosophically from other organizations. And so we then had to develop all these different competencies to figure out, well, how do we train all these people? How do we manage it effectively? How do we get all these people aligned to all these nuanced concepts, you know, in multiple languages across the world while delivering for our players, right? While figuring out how to scale our operations, while doing all those things. And so the surface area just increases while we're launching esports. So then and there's, so then there's all these new problems from an mm -hmm. esports standpoint. Mm -hmm. when players are upset about particular things and franchise owners are upset about things and advertisers don't want to, they're doubting, you know, I mean, there's just, there's always a million problems. Right. And so there's always fires to put out. And not only do you have to figure out a way to deliver in the short term, mm -hmm. you also have to be working on the long term, more optimal, sustainable solutions. Right. And you need to not die, right? And sort of, and burn out and kill yourself. You know, and so, um, you know, I, th I do think the hardest thing for an entrepreneur is managing your own psychology. Because some days you feel like you're going to take over the world and other days you feel like, oh my God, how can I possibly get out of this? Or I'm so exhausted or, you know, especially because, you're just every like you're responsible for everything that doesn't doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's a problem, kind of gets dumped on you, or you have to help figure out how to help your leaders solve it or how to solve it, you know. And then you also, I think, effective leaders try not to take credit. Right? They're giving credit to their team, they're sharing credit, and so it can be a pretty lonely road. Right. And, which is why it's actually I think been great for our relationship that we can relate to each other on this dynamic because. You know, you can just see it in your spouse's eyes some days when they come home that, you know, they're dealing with something that's just right. tough mm -hmm. and nobody can understand. And, you know, hopefully yeah. we can and, you know, be there. And yeah. It's one of the out. blessings of having us both having gone through this. And, and I will say, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but there's a lot of challenges to having this dual founder scenario. Right. Um, <laughs> and I think... Uh, our personality types were very extreme. I mean, Mark spoke earlier about uh, how when you have a when you have a startup, particularly these kind, there are babies, there are a third child. We actually, you're sitting in, in, you know, we built a home with more bedrooms than we have kids because I thought we were going to have a much bigger family. Instead, we had businesses and really were like, no, there's just no, we can't take any more. No, it's more offices. Yeah, it's more offices. Now, like one room is like a memorabilia. Yeah, the other exactly. one's just like clothes. Right. <laughs> okay. yeah. Show, yeah. Showroom. We do have two wonderful kids. Yes, yeah. we have wonderful kids. Who but you it, might hear from maybe like, or you already heard from at yeah. one point of this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you know, it, it is, uh, it's, I think what makes founders unique um, is that it is so highly personal. They're going to do whatever it takes if they're going to be successful to, to make it work. And, and I think with that, though, it takes an incredible toll on you, um, just really emotionally. And, and Mark talked about this. That's you are responsible for everything. If somebody doesn't like their job, they can quit. I can't quit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and these are, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but it, it's, it's, you know, I'm going on seven years now. He was thir 12 years in, in the CEO seat. It's, it's, um, it's exhausting. And, and so the, I think that having, you know, I don't have a, a partner and people often ask me like, oh, was that weird to not have a partner? And, and I was lucky because in a lot of ways I could come home and just be like, oh my gosh, this thing just happened. And he could relate to it or, you know, I would have learned from an experience that he had. And so there was a lot there. Yeah. And I'm sure like throughout it all, you guys are both um, obviously trying your best to make everything work. But going back, like, would you have done anything differently? For sure. No, knowing what you know now, right? Because like, obviously we can talk about the other side of it, which is right. you both, both built really success, no, successful yeah. businesses. So like, right. how could we, how, like, how could you, I guess. Pick, well, pick the thing that's so interesting about failure or challenges or hurt feelings or negative experiences is, you know, I really do believe that one necessity is mother of all mentioned Two, failure is an incredible teacher. And so it's interesting. It's like when we were in sort of say some of the darker times in our relationship where we were sort of like business partners, like just operating shoulder to shoulder, getting through the day and the weeks for years, you know, and being like, oh, yeah, you, you know, like how do, what, what should we go on a date? What does that look like? How do we do it? How do we not feel guilty about all the other things we're not doing at the time? Like that's a real situation and, 
you know, that, that we experienced for a while. And um, so there's a lot of interesting dynamics that occur around that. But what's interesting is in our experience, I think, recognizing that, say, the trend of the relationship was trending downwards from a quality, from a communication, from an emotional, you know, connection standpoint, et cetera. I think we both were like, that. this is not sustainable or cool. What do we do about it? And once we once we sort of had it have enough challenge to then really take it seriously about like, how do we change our dynamic? That was the catalyst to help us both reflect on how are we showing up in our relationship? What can we do? You know, and I had yeah. two different coaches I'd hired that helped me really think differently about how I was showing up in the relationship because I think it was easy for me to Talk be about the critical. Cycle, the thing where they talked about the virtuous cycle, I think that was a really good one. Yeah. So, um, well, uh, you, maybe you can go in on that. But so one of the things that I think was really helpful for me was recognizing that, like, I could, it's easy for people to point out flaws or other things that other people aren't doing. And everybody can be, you know, good at identifying problems. I'm one of those people who's also good at identifying problems. So I could look at different things that Ash was not doing or different things, you know, situations where I thought she engaged with me suboptimally and I could be like, this is valid criticism, check, 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 right? And feel justified, therefore, in having negative emotions and, you know, maybe directing them to her. And if, I, if that's the way that I interpret our interactions and whatnot, of course that's not going to be helpful. And so a coach really helped me recognize the only person you can never control is yourself, right? And so... What outcome do you want for other people and, you know, with these people? And if you want it to be positive, then even if you perceive that there's negativity coming your way or whatnot, don't react with additional negativity. Say like, hey, like the, the way here's, I'm not going to have judgment on what you're saying, but saying this experience that you had, like just made me feel this way. Just FYI, right? And then also try to con- recognize and control your own reaction. When I started to really practice that and learn be like, I'm going to try to highlight how I'm feeling, what's happening, what I'm doing, and be more deliberate about trying to cultivate positive interactions. It had a transformative impact on my mindset, I think, on our dynamic. I think um, she had, you know, when I talk about laundry list of criticism, she probably had a thousand things much longer that were very valid. Um, And so, but to her point around virtuous cycles versus vicious cycles, you know, I think people and teams and countries and, you know, any type of environment or relationship can get into either vicious cycles, or virtuous, virtuous cycles and the vicious cycles. It's like the tit for tat, never ending, mm. continues to trend downward. Right. But similarly, somebody has to decide to change that trajectory and say, I'm going to try to stop. And like there needs to be an intermedi- intermediary or. I mean, so I'm going to use yeah. an example. So like, I think with kids, I think kids are the perfect thing because they push you to a place that you just straight up never thought you could go. Mark and I are very type A doers. We thought, you know, we can handle anything. Kids broke us down. Right. I'm just like, that's that totally did. Sleep deprivation. Um, you know, we had two kids almost on top of each other. They're 15 months apart while running businesses. Very busy time in our life. And I think... The lack of recovery time... It's horrible. For, that was sustained for years was just... It was a disaster. Yeah, it, it, it really... And so what ends up happening is you feel so bad. And, and both of us have felt bad in that period. And, and there's no handbook for how to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, either my relationship's crap, like I don't know what's going on with my relationship, Um, I feel just pretty unhappy, and so like my way of dealing with it would be I closed off emotionally. I was like, I I have nothing left to give. Like I am survival. Like I, I was like, it, it, you can't, he would like want emotional connection from him, from me, and I would just look at him and be like, are you, are you out of your mind? Like, do you, do you actually think I have anything to give to you right now? And, and I think that, um, and, and so that from his way of interpreting it is like, okay, I'm with somebody who's like, not considering how I'm feeling, which wasn't the case at all. It's just that I was in such a bad place, I didn't even know how to help him. And so I'd say that the easy reaction is, you make me feel bad, so I'm going to make you feel bad. Yeah. And sometimes we do that unintentionally, right? It's like resentment. That's where resentment builds. Like I didn't get enough sleep, and that I feel resentful of the fact that you did. And and so right. you're, you're just basically passing bad feelings around back and forth to yeah. each other. Keeping score on like yeah. how many diapers have you changed or how who's 
spent more time over the last week, yeah. you know, waking up with the kids to, you know, nurse them back to sleep. Yeah. And so it's, it's this kind of like brutal, no one's, you don't get thanked for being a parent, mm-hmm. right? And we're mm-hmm. doing this while we're running these crazy businesses. So we've taken an already extreme situation and then we've, we've turned it up a notch. And so we were just, I would say, wholly unprepared for what yeah. we walked into. And, yeah. yeah. And I feel like something that happens um, often in, in, in these situations is like it becomes normal. Right. And then, right. and then, and then that's what they always, you know, say like, oh, the spark or that, like, where's the spark? Right. It's like, I feel like it becomes normal. Like right. you normalize it somehow by like right. either making excuses for you, yourself or the other person. Right. Um, because totally. you love them, obviously. And you, you want your, you know, they're, you know, trying to obviously put a foot on the table and support the family too. So they're, it's not like they're only in it for themselves. Like right. it's a, it's a collective thing. But how do you break, how do you not allow that to happen? Well, I will say, um, empathy. And it's, that's actually what the foundation of the deep is about. And I know we're going to talk about the deep later, but, um, but empathy really matters. And I think this kind of ties back to what Mark said earlier, which was one of the gifts is that while this was insane to be doing all these things at once, was that we actually can empathize with where one another is coming from. And so when we really got a handle on our marriage wasn't in a good place, and we finally started to have just enough bandwidth to even confront that reality and we realized that we were not communicating very well I think when we could change our perspective enough to go hey like actually our mindset is like I want this to be my person how do I get to a place where we can get back to enjoying each other's company or at least just being on the same team uh, I think it changes the, the, the frame of mind you know and and so suddenly when I when I come home and I think he didn't recognize that when I was shutting down, that I wasn't pulling away from him. I, he didn't recognize that I was in such a bad place that that was how I was surviving. Mm-hmm. But when we started, when we got to a bad enough place, we had to start to talk about that. And I was like, you know, no, that, that wasn't anything to do with you. That only had to do with me. And, mm-hmm. and so when that kind of stuff came out, I think then he went, oh, right. I get what you're feeling. And then when I recognized, oh, wow, I could see where, like, you're going to read my shutting down as I don't love you, that that would make you feel, you know, and so, so I think when we were both willing, when we had the emotional bandwidth and we both kind of came back to the, like, at the end of the day, we do want to make this work. Uh, that was the thing, um, that really helped us is communication and empathy with one another. So I know, I know Mark started his business a few years before yours. Yes. Um, when you were obviously like thinking about Lunia, was any part of it um, to want to be in the game too, like for yourself? To, 100%. To, because it was kind of like he's going through it. So like kind of like the whole thing, like I, you know, I, I have to go through it too. So that way we're kind of equal. Yeah. So I think I, um, Mark and I joke about this a little bit, but I think sometimes successful people have a decent dose of insecurity or something that they want to prove. And I am, that is definitely true for me. Um, I think, you know, I just, I never, neither of us ever expected to have the kind of success league had. Um, I was always interested in business that had nothing to do with this. I was always a business person. I assumed I'd be able to live an upper middle class lifestyle like what my parents did and that he like and mine. I would both have yeah. professional jobs and that we'd both be earning and we'd both have a, you know, a comfortable lifestyle and mm-hmm. I figured that was going to be what it was. And so that I had expected a lifestyle of more equality. And then when this happened, I was very unprepared emotionally. Did and you actually, have any sort of bitterness towards what he had built or no? No. So my bitterness wasn't about that, but it brought up a lot of insecurity right. in me, which was, who am I now in this world? Like, right. I never planned to be the, the kept woman. That, like the identity crisis. I had a huge identity crisis. And I think it's taken me a long time to to feel. And, you know, it wasn't so much. So there was an aspect of um, external. I did have this one interview. I just remember that's I can't remember what magazine it was. It was crushing. Um, It was one of my entrepreneur magazine. It was one of my first interviews with business press. And um, this is after Lunia. This is with after Lunia started. And it was, they infuriated me. Yeah, it was crazy. I don't know. Maybe it's not crazy. Look, News is about sensationalism, and they knew what to say. So they, they inter- he interviewed me. It was a great interview. I thought everything went well. Anyway, I read it, and it came out, and it was like um, sort of like wealthy housewife decides to, I mean, decides to make a clothing company, and she had no experience in fashion. And I, I called them after. It was 
horrible because I'm like, first of all, it's not a fashion company. I saw a market opportunity, which I went into, and I have a business degree, and I don't have, I'm not completely an MBA from UCLA. Right. Worked in a venture capital firm pri- previously. Right. Like, didn't do anything around qualifications or credentials or like the the strategic thought behind the business or how it's mm-hmm. positioned or the right. problem she's trying to solve. Purely trivialized right. her yeah. experience and positioned her as like negative as you possibly could, which was absurd. It played into all the insecurities that we were talking about mm-hmm. that I had here. It's like, mm-hmm. what I think I always wanted to feel was that I was a contributor, that I could like be an important part of our lifestyle, that if we went out with people that people would want to talk to me too, right. you know? And, and I think I just went in this new dynamic, how do I, who am I, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that in a way it was helpful though, because it is so hard to build a business that you all, you need something that you're trying to, something that you need that you, you know, and, and for me that, that need, and it really wasn't about, it wasn't to mark. What I realized after is I needed to prove to myself that I was like an equal, I want to feel confident that I can talk to my kids and be like, yeah, I contributed in some way. I think if I was like a killer stay at home mom, mm-hmm. I would have felt differently because I would have been like, wow, I'm, you know what? I'm like a killer stay at home mom. I just, I've never really had an interest in that role. And so then I went, well, okay, now what am I? Like, I'm not this like killer stay at home mom. I'm, I'm going to be like the kept wife. I don't even, who, who am I, you know? And well, so your expectations were not met. Well, and this was an interesting dynamic for me, right? right? Cause here I am, here I am, you know, killing myself. We're starting to have a success. I'm thrilled about that. Like, hey, right. look at this. You know, you're like, like why aren't you happy? We're yes. sharing, and, and then it's like, yeah, it's like, wow, oh, this is causing major problems for yeah. you. I'm, I'm sorry. I clearly didn't intend it. You know, but, and so then, and this were, was where I think the self awareness and learning how to communicate what I was feeling without judgment, mm. which I didn't learn for many years, probably after this, was super helpful because then it was, you know, like I'm, I think I'm the type of person who grew up trying to be stoic, right? Where I would tough it out. Don't, it's fine. Sort of I can typical just old school man vibes. Right. Yeah. yeah. I can repress emotions. And, and you know, Mark, I'm curious because I know a lot of, you know, men that listen to this podcast and both Pat and I like are in serious relationships with intelligent women that have aspirations yeah. to be like Ashley and go on and do great things. You know, what, what is your advice as a father, husband, founder to these younger men who are in relationships and, you know, want Don't to be it. building <laughs> but i mean yeah that's that's one one answer but how do you manage that expectation how do you control the communication from both parties so that you become not only this person that's going out there and working because i feel like you know for my parents i'm sure pat's parents early on like you know it was more the traditional male traditional female right. role and they knew that that's what it was right, right. they knew right. that that's the role i'm going to play that's the role you're going to play my parents had that yeah. right exactly. and my parents too we and nowadays them. especially in la you know where we live right. it's very hard to have a house sold with just one income totally. right a lot of people are not privileged mm-hmm. but how does one have that discussion i know actually we talked about this in the early days but how do you have that discussion with your significant other even early on so that you don't progress maybe to the next level of right. your relationship if you're not on the same page well i think first step is be honest with yourself around what you want out of life and what you want out of your spouse you know, and partner and what you want your relationship to now to be so like i am fortunate in that i genuinely want and value her as a strong, intelligent, ambitious woman who's incredibly capable. And I have always perceived myself as being incredibly supportive of whatever her ambitions or desires would be, right? So like, I want her to self-actualize. How that desire would manifest from a behavior or communication or support standpoint, though, needs to also align with what she actually needs. And that's something that she needed to get better at, at helping to communicate, like, are the things that I'm providing actually meeting her needs or are they not? And similarly, I needed to ensure that I was continually asking and reflecting on that and thinking about that and thinking, and not just thinking about my own perspective and being like, Hey, I'm doing all this stuff. Isn't this great? Isn't this great? How are you doing? You know, if it's also causing some problems to her. And then if she is highlighting that there are some issues, I need to have the maturity to not take that so personally but recognize that it's because of the context, right? And then think about, but but still also be aware of how that's impacting me emotionally and then express that. And that was something that was very difficult for me because I would just internalize some hurt feelings that I would have around feeling unappreciated, um, you know, from a bunch of different perspectives. And, you know, I think that would start to harbor some resentment, right? Which I think is probably common in many relationships. 
unfortunately. And I think one of the things that really helped change that cycle is again that when that my coach helped me realize you can't control other people. Only you can do is help highlight when they do a thing, how that makes you feel. And I think when I started to really internalize that and do that, Ash was like, "Wow, I don't, I don't want you to feel bad. I don't right. want to make you experience these things." And so then that caused her to reflect, it, it, and like, "Well, how how is she showing up for me?" So the so the other thing that I think was a big turning point for us is we read the Cliff Notes version of oh, yeah. um, Love Languages, and it was a it was a, like t- physical touch gifts. Yes, oh, okay. it was. Unbelievable for us. It's okay. magic. So, yeah, yeah, so Mark yeah. and I realized <laughs> this is the funniest thing. So, so his top two are words of affirmation and physical touch. Same. And mine are <laughs> acts of service and physical touch in that order, right? So what was crazy is that he was wanting, I like, I don't even understand words of affirmation. Like to me, that doesn't make sense. Like, I don't need you to tell me I'm great. Show me. Like, I'm like, it's right. so easy. She's to like, talk is cheap. Talk Why is would cheap. you do that? So yeah. she would negatively judge the thing I even wanted. Right. But I didn't know that's what he wanted at the time because I didn't understand the language. So what was happening was Mark was like lighting me up with words of affirmation, which I don't even hear them. They like are couldn't mean less to me. Is it because you expected him to say that already? No, it's because he was giving love in the way he wants right. to receive it. Right, because that's what is familiar and makes sense to me. Right. right, and I was doing the same thing. I was like, you know, making breakfast for him and doing things, which is acts of service, which he was like, this is nice, but it, he, and then he'd still be like, but do you love me? And I'd be like, are you out of your mind? Like, I just woke up at 6 a.m. to make you breakfast. So it was this, we, we both, when we read it, we cracked up laughing because it explained like the five years that had just happened right. and where a lot of the miscommunication had come from. And so it's been a game changer and now a source of a lot of laughter for us because, um, you know, we always, we reflect on this a lot. Well, and therefore we both actively worked on improving at showing love in the way that our partner wants to receive it yes. rather than what we are just comfortable with. And that's, that's a... That's uncomfortable at times. It's difficult. It's something that we need to grow at and learn at and I'm practice. I'm still practicing. And, yeah, we, we both still are. You know, and um, yeah. So. Another, another thing I think that when we talk about selecting your life partner, mm-hmm. um, I was I remember this before we got married. I said, you know, I'm not going to want a dynamic like your parents want. I, I think I want to work. And I think my mom would always look at me and she'd go, you and Mark are like so rational in the way you guys approach your relationship. She'd go you know, your dad and I, we just fell in love and we got married. And then whatever happened, happened. That was not how this happened. We did fall in love, but we were like pretty tactical about it. Like, you know, we had conversations about some expectations in that area. And I will tell you, like, if I was to give words of advice, we've had really close friends that maybe didn't hit some of those topics as much on the head. And I think that that stuff comes up later. And I mean, specifics, like, uh, you know, how you think about money, mm-hmm. what does success looks like for you. Do you want to have kids? Do you want to have kids? Do you want to work? Do you want to stay home with the kids? Should I stay home with the kids? You know, like really getting into the nitty gritty because those are the things that actually break you down. You want to like raise there. the kids with religion. Yeah, yeah how important exactly. is that? Right? But I feel like with so many things, like like something like this is so unpredictable. No one knows how their life is going to no. play out. So is there some sort of like framework that you're familiar with or something that you, you can point to like for folks to look to before they even get into the thick of it because they know that they're working towards something and it's going to come, hopefully, obviously. Yeah. But, like, they're going to have to deal with it at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think hitting those life hitting values and the big life questions before you get married, um, or, you know, is, is a really great move. I think it saved us a lot of um, uh, mis- miscommunication. I also, like, I can't recommend that book enough, that love language book. Yeah. Um, but another thing that a friend of mine... Uh, she she was a member of the church, and before she got married, um, they had her go through exercises. And one of my favorite ones, which I'm 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 advocating for this, but I'll tell you, I'm still guilty of not totally following this, um, is they had her write a list of ten things that she loved about her husband to be, and then ten things she disliked or that annoyed her about her husband to be. And he said, "Look at those lists, um, and then uh, crumple up the one of the things you love about that person." Is like, throw it away. You're always going to love those things about that person. Now look at the other list and go, can I live with this? And assume you're never going to change that person and go, and, and is that still going to be okay? And I thought that was such a healthy way of thinking about it because you're not going to be able to assume perfection from your partner. And so to get comfortable around, like, can I love them for their strengths and their weaknesses is kind of a, a good right. way to start. Like, Ashley, 
are you going to be okay with the fact that your husband to be loves playing video games <laughs> whenever he possibly can? Yes. When traveling or when having an ounce of time, wants to think about them all the time. Like yes. that. Nonstop. But, he, yeah. I just want to, for the record, say that he hid the fact that he played <laughs> video games from me early on in the relationship. My, and my that must have been hard to do as my, time progressed. Well, for sure. My perspective was not that I was hiding it. I was, one, I was early in my career, so I was working on that. Two, I, I didn't, I don't prioritize advertising that, right? You don't like lead with, <laughs> hey, guess what? You know, like, this is how I love to spend my time. <laughs> like, you still want to get married at some point. Right. Like, he, you don't want it to be a He made sure I was, I was pretty bought in before he was like, okay, but yeah. now here's right. the other Unless thing. it was, you know, I would be dating somebody that also self-identifies a gamer yes, and sort right. of we yes. shared that passion, which is not the case here. Right. right. And, and that's been a thing that's been interesting too, is, you know, where we've been reflecting over time. I'm like, hey, like, you know, and we've had these conversations where she's like, would you be happier with somebody who loves gaming like you do or whatnot? And, you know, I think she's been asking herself, like, would she be happier with somebody who loves fashion and art and whatnot mm -hmm. and, you know, in the way that she does? And, you know, I think our conclusion, and again, you know, we're 10 years in of hopefully a very long journey, you know, but it, like, I fundamentally don't We're rooting for that. Yeah, I fundamentally don't believe that you need to have your Venn diagrams overlap completely from an interest standpoint. I think it's much more important around values. I think you, I think it's really important to not negatively judge the things that the other person's into, but you don't need to have, uh, you know, to be like super into it yourself. As long as you can appreciate what's cool about it and be able to support in the right way and, and go and not be like a negative Nancy, yeah. you know, around things or like I loved traveling with her when we were in Paris and going around to all the shops. Right? I, I love it. I love that you bring this up because I feel like it's something that I've definitely, you know, had to go through that with my girlfriend in terms of like she has interests that I don't share and vice versa. And, and, and I think a lot of it does come down to sacrifice, but I think a lot of it um, also comes down to like experiencing more things together because you don't know right. there could be something that you both love that you've never done before. And all of a sudden you have this like right. bond over this thing. So like, is that, is there anything else to it or is that pretty much? No, for sure. Well, yeah. and so in interesting enough, like I think Ashley exemplified a lot of things I wanted to be right or get better at or wanted in my life mm. and so like as an example i perceive her as very wholesome and, and so like she would go to farmer's market right and buy vegetables and whatnot and fruits i didn't even know what a farmer's market was like, i got that it was the coolest thing in the world she's like oh you want to hang out with me okay do you want to go for a run on six at 6 a.m with this running group for 15 miles at saturday morning and this I, was and, the very and, early stage of our relationship very like, early honestly stage. i'm out i'm gonna yeah. go do something and i'm else. like sure you know, and like I he had, had to never start in at 15 miles. <laughs> I had <laughs> never run more than like 10 miles in my entire life up to this point. Combined. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, unfortunately I was I wasn't, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I was a decent yeah, runner, yeah. but uh, you know, this was this was I definitely was not doing that. And so, <laughs> yeah. but I, you know, I just, I sort of locked on behind her and you know and, and you know, got my mind right. But but no, it is just interesting because uh, so I like the fact that she pushes me to be better in a lot of ways. And you know, and I think that's that's something that I was looking for. And I think it was important to find somebody like that. Mark's a singular focus type of person. So I think that, uh, you know, left to his own devices will kind of dive incredibly deep into something. And I think that's why gaming, particularly the kind of gaming that he's so passionate about, really suits... He's like the Kobe Bryant of gaming. <laughs> there, I mean... I mean, he's like, he has an obsessive character for sure. Yeah, right. it's, it's exactly, yeah. and I mean, it shows up. Which is a positive, up. like when it comes to business for sure. I think like in company a, building. Yeah. And well, he yeah. understands, yeah. It's, that's one interesting thing about his, his shift in role is that he gets to get back to being a, a player again. He's, he's oh, back into being a community. So if you, you know, it's funny because, you know, what did he do with his free time? He filled it with video games, yeah. you know? And I think that's, that's cool. To me, I'm like, I actually look at that and I tell him this every day, but it's like, that seems amazing mm. to me because, you know, he spent his career trying to build this epic video game, which while he got to enjoy it an incredible amount, you know, he was running it. That responsibility almost makes it hard to, to stay in it in the same way. And so now he's getting to like, like live his passion, which is really right. cool. Which is cool because it reignites my desire to do other cool things, which is also fun. You know, just say it all along to build this whole business was just so you can get to a point where you can play video games for the rest of your <laughs> life and not have to worry about anything else. That <laughs> is a serious part of the motivation. I like to joke with her, uh, you know, not like semi joke, I should say. And be like, yeah, I, like I'd be like a, you know, maybe above average lawyer, above average doctor, you know, or banker, professional, whatever. And, uh, but I, like I, I happened to land in a sweet spot of something I could really excel at. And if I didn't, right, if, if I, you know, still being me, had this love of video games, 
the opportunity cost, it's like, why aren't you selling more? Why aren't you going and doing whatever? Right. Like, it feels like a waste of time. Like, that would be a constant source of battle and oh. friction. And I would feel tremendously unfulfilled. Right. And it would be this, it would be a very difficult life. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I'm grateful that uh, it all worked out I've been able to sort of justify like, hey, honey, I'm working, right? This yeah. is important. Yeah, that doesn't work for me anymore. It's <laughs> putting that out there. I do do that occasionally to him though. And I'm like, look, I, I have to go shopping. I am literally <laughs> in the clothing business. Yeah. I got to stay current. Right. See, but I'm like, Go. I know. Let's do it. Have I know. It doesn't do work the do. same way because I can't shop for like right. 40 hours a week, but he right. could play video games. You know, and, and just want to kind of combine, you know, like personal life and business because I think that one of the greatest reasons we started the Founder Hour and not like the Business Hour was really focusing on the human element. Of yeah. It. Because I think that ideas, I mean, every, come and go every second, right? Right. Like, a right. lot of people can build ideas into companies and maybe some others can't. And, you know, a lot of things are cool. But I think that one thing that really ties it together is, you know, you, you talk about values. Pat and I have talked about it this in the past. Uh, I think you did the exercise that my future father-in-law, so my girlfriend's dad, yeah. taught us ta or told us about this whole values exercise where you'd like literally go Google values. It's like a few hundred of them. And then you whittle it down to 20 and then 10 and then five and then three. And it applies to life, relationships, business. Yeah. Because all the things that you have just talked about here that were – communication issues between the two of you guys and expectations and values. Yeah. Those are things that also come up in a business. Yeah. Right. right? I'm not saying that a relationship is a business, but more so there are a lot of relationships in business that you have to either manage or cut or bring new ones on or even when you're building a company. So how do you see that your challenges have made you better leaders? Your, or I guess I should say, how have your personal challenges made you better business leaders? I think it's a great question. And uh, to your point, I, I actually think that being a effective person, right, and being values oriented and, and learning how to have high quality human interactions and whatnot is sort of like a fundamental skill that if you can get good at will serve you well in whatever you do. It'll, it'll become sort of this force, force multiplier. And so I actually think that a lot of the best practices in business and management and leadership also translate to a certain extent with being a good spouse and partner and father or mother yeah, uh, or agree. friend, you know, in terms of being clear from a communication standpoint and expectations and, you know, showing up and being dependable, right. And uh, being led by, you know, sort of a vision of a, a future that could be better or aspirational. I mean, all of these things are universal that, Again, whether it's the business arena, whether it's sports, whether it's religion, whether it's the you know be working in government or nonprofits, those skills translate to helping everybody be more effective. Yeah. And so I think that you know the the number one like piece of advice my dad would always give me, you know, or that I always thought it was a paradox didn't make any sense to me, but he would say the hardest person to manage is yourself. Right? And I think that there is such wisdom in that, and it's totally true. I didn't start to really appreciate it probably to my late twenties, but essentially what he's meaning is. If you can figure out how to manage and master yourself, manage your own mind, how to be disciplined, how to learn, you know, things like that, it will unlock lots of potential for you. And yeah, so one of the books that I always recommend to people when they ask is that it's Harvard Business Review's 10 best articles on how to manage oneself. Yeah. Because I think it's, fun, it's a fundamental building block that enables everybody to get better at everything. The other thing your dad said was, happy wife, happy life. For sure. Well, and he, said, he also said, he's got a lot of good wisdom. He also you said know. your wife is definitely going to remind you of that. <laughs> Constantly. Well, and, and my wife and my dad actually have a lot in common. Yeah. Uh, it's you know, true. Which is sort of interesting. Yeah. You know, but he also, um, you know, he said a lot, a lot of interesting things. But he also said, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. It also talks about necessity being mother on invention. Um, you know, but a lot of, I think, sort of philosophical principles that have guided me. Yeah, I, I think another, when you talk about the overlap between personal and professional, and I try to think when I'm doing podcasts, I try to think about like what are real tactical things people can take away. That's why people love you. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things that we just did recently that I think was really awesome, so, so you know, here he and I have been running businesses for a long time. Our businesses have uh, uh, values, they have a mission statement, they have 
um, you know, purpose, this, all the stuff outlined. And we had never done that for our personal life. Mm -hmm. So we only just recently went, you know, are, are we on the same path? Do we want the same thing? What are the things we stand for? And um, it was an incredible exercise, I think, to do. To And I actually would say I would recommend people do that earlier on, you know, when we talk about early tips. Ideally but, before getting married. Yeah, ideally before right. getting married. Because, you know, imagine if you realize that you don't share a vision. You know, and, and how much that would change things for you. So I just, I think that's a really great one that we think of so commonly in the business world, but, you know, why not bring that home? Mm. Yeah, good one. Transitioning into more so what Lunia has been doing the last, I guess, year and also the deep. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your recent adventures and recent updates? Sure. Yeah. So, um, gosh, I can't remember exactly where I left off with you, but I would say Lunia was doing great. Um, <laughs> still is. Okay, still yeah. Spoiler. Is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you had not launched Lago yet. Yeah. Okay. So Lunia's doing, um, it's continuing to do really well. It's growing. Um, the team is growing, which has been a really interesting and wonderful experience for me. Um, and we've started to, um, so we recently, back in October of 19, we launched Lago which is a men's brand mm. and that came uh, from a couple of places one of the places it came from was just men were asking for it they were showing up in Lunia's bedrooms and saying okay like what about us um, and 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 you know I think I thought oh I'd always get around to it um, but it was interesting because I started to uh, I listened to I can't remember what speaker it was and she was talking about um, you know how women are going to show up as leaders and you know we don't want to exclude just because we've been excluded, you know, and she had this quote like this and I thought, wow, I'm excluding guys. I'm excluding them from this whole recovery, um, wellness conversation. And, and, I can't believe I'm doing it, you know? And so it was a really interesting moment. And even Mark would be like, what am I going to get some gear, you know? And, it, and it was a funny thing because I think I had just been so deeply in what I was doing that I didn't think, you know, yeah, men are going to want this too because there's not a great solve for them around mm -hmm. the home. And I um, want to be confidently comfortable in my off hours. Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. While exactly. I'm gaming. Yeah, yeah, while I'm gaming. I know. I know. For him in particular, <laughs> yeah. there's a real value proposition there. Big collaboration there potentially. There you go. Sure. There Gamers. you go. I'm just trying to like get into that gaming <laughs> yeah, audience yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so Lago's been amazing. Uh, it's been yeah. it's been a really great, exciting experience. And it's also been fascinating to be running two businesses mm -hmm. at the same time. One which is sort of a, a growing business with, you know, like more team and all that. And then one, which is very much of a startup. It's back in the old school way we started Lunia and, and they're, they're similar and they share resources, but you, you have to treat, you know, that, that business is small and can't be treated like you can treat mm -hmm. Lunia because it's not a mature brand yet. And so, uh, it's been really interesting, this experience of trying to juggle two and the and, deep is so cool. Well, Way to do the spoiler alert. Sorry. Okay, so. <laughs> he just couldn't wait. I know. No, I he does this to me all the time. I do. When I, I do. Tell he was Joseph, talking about Lunia and Lago. He was, he was, he was so like, excited about the deep where he was just like, we got to talk yeah. about this. It was I actually like philosophy. He right? does this so to like, me all the time I when do. I'm telling a joke. I'll be like, dude, Punchline. I was getting to that. Yeah. So anyway, okay, so what my husband alluded to is. Um, well, before you get okay. into that, I remember that. So you're a big fan of circles. I remember saying yes. that last time. Venn diagrams. Ikigai, yes. I read the book after we had the conversation. It was amazing. Yes. Great. So good. I, I think we recommended it. My girlfriend read it too. I haven't, she stole my book. I bought it. <laughs> so we're going to have to get that back. Um, but I remember the center of that, if I'm not mistaken, was creative challenges. Yes, okay. creative challenge. So how has, do you think that you've done a good job at focusing on that? On focusing on what you truly want and, you know, well, desire? I have two different competing things going on at the same right. time, which is my ultimate job, I'm the CEO at Lunia, is to give, to make Lunia be successful, and, and Lago now to be successful. And and so what's what's interesting, and I think this is one of the things that, you know, when Mark was talking about what it means to be a founder, where you're pouring yourself into something, which is, you know, I have to recognize when and where my skill sets and strengths and interests serve the company best and when they don't. Um, and I think that this is one thing that I, I have the luxury of, of building a business after watching my husband build a business. So what's cool is I, I'm also watching him going, okay, what of that appeals to me? And what of that 
is probably not something I'm interested in. And so as an example, what I know is I love creative challenge. Founders are often very good at, at creative challenge, actually, because all it is is problem, solve it, problem, right. solve it. How do you, you're, you're overcoming, you have, you're under-resourced, out of time, you know, you're, you're always dealing with this. And so that's what founders are really used to. When your company gets to be a certain size, though, the needs of the business shift. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think sometimes founders are not always the right person to run a mature you know, organization right. because then it's about scale, people, process. And, and that, while it's something I, I appreciate, uh, it's not p appealing to my it's core like ikigai. Well, uh, it I would it I, can yeah. be creative, okay. but it's not the kind of creative that lights right. me up, right. right? And so what I have been trying to do is be really honest with what I'm good at and what uh, is best for me to focus on um, and then figure out now what, what do I need to do to set Lunia up for success? And that maybe isn't that I need to run Lunia forever. It might be that I need to figure out who is somebody where that scale, big picture process, people thinking lights them up. And so, you know, for me, I actually am trying to think a lot about um, how do I put myself in the in the right position to serve Lunia because that is actually my job. And, and um and then, you know, and then how does that relate to what I'm good at? And I think that's going to be something that will evolve as mm. the business grows. So the deep. Okay. You guys are already busy as fuck. <laughs> I mean, you have two kids. You're running like a multi-billion dollar company. You're about to run a multi-billion dollar company. I mean, wh why? Like what, what got into you guys again? Why create more problems and challenges and stress? Yeah. So I will say um, what's been interesting uh, with both Mark and I, is I think as you start to, you know, we're starting to have success in our businesses and feel very self-actualized. We're also parents. Um, and so our perspective has shifted a lot in the past maybe handful of years. And I think we have, um, uh, it, it's begun a journey for us of, you know, who are we? you know, what are we here for as individuals and as humans? Uh, you know, wh what do we think, um, what is the ideal future? What do we what do we want to see um, for humanity? And 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 do we care about the broad humanity? Asking ourselves some big questions. And I think a lot of that is hand in hand with the, some of the transitions that Mark's been making. And and honestly, when you start to have kids, you you really start to think about the future in a different way. And and so you've had a lot of these things happen. And I think for Mark, what what's happened for him is he you know has been looking at what's going on politically. He's very much of an organizational thinker. And I think. Actually, there's there's an interesting synergy between that and video games thinking, mm -hmm. but he he looks at like System systems, yeah. yeah, systems thinking, and and um, and so I think for him, he's gotten very involved politically and in going, wow, we have a broken political system. How could I get involved and help move that forward? And that really resonated with him, and frankly, with me too. It's just that like when he was saying, you know, he's got some great ideas for how to solve that and, and dig in there. Um, and, and is involved with Represent Us and Unite America. And, um, and I think it's definitely the right time to be looking at how to make these changes. Um, and meanwhile, you know, and I think this journey of figuring out what matters um, sent me in a different direction. It sent me into sort of a philosophical quest, you know? And I, what I realized, one of the funniest things um, about getting older is um, I feel less sure that I'm right about everything. Yeah. <laughs> Which is weird because in the time when I actually am probably closer to being right than I was when I was 25, <laughs> I feel far less sure than I am. Right. And and so I was actually giving a... Because the more you know about just the world and yourself, like the more um, exposure you have yeah. to things where you're like, wow, I'm not like as big as like I thought I was. And it, I'm just like... Well, oh, it, it's yeah. one of the great ironies in life. Yeah. How the sort of ignorance of youth that we all have Right, can manifest so strongly in the righteousness around one's own perspective, uh -huh. which unfortunately can manifest negatively where it justifies people doing bad things to others. You know, but uh, anyway, like, you know, we, I think we both feel that profoundly, where as we learn more about how the world works, that we learn more about people and different perspectives and travel the world, the more we can take, you know, have perspective to reflect on all of the things that we believe. It's, it's that, to me... Um, it, it almost feels like you'd be naive to feel like you have the answers. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to give a funny example. This isn't like the greatest example. Um, I, I um, when I was younger, I, like if I was driving on the freeway and someone cut me off, like I would have a, 
a flick that person off inclination. And maybe I would do that too. Yeah. Um, and now I think, God, I wonder like wh where that person's going, yeah. you know, like as a parent, I think like, I wonder if they, like something happened with their kids or, you know, and, and so that's such a different reaction. Um, and I think that time and exp personal experiences have really shifted how I think about the world. I also had another conversation. This is one of the reasons that the deep really came to fruition. There's been a lot of sort of mm. things that led up to right. the deep. Um, and the deep, by the way, um, it's, it's um, the deep dot life on Instagram. And um, it's a, it's an Instagram account and a newsletter at this point. But really what it is, is uh, we say it's a, 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 a playground for curious minds, yeah. but it, it's really supposed to be something that kind of helps you figure out who you are, what you stand for, and helps you understand others um, in a, in a way that is a communication style that is, I would say, and this is why I'm so passionate about it, altogether different than how we're seeing people communicate right now. Mm -hmm. I think right now what we're seeing is most people stand up and say, this is how I feel, you're right, I'm wrong. And what that leads to is massive polarization. And we're seeing that in a huge way. Mm -hmm. And to me, I mean, when you talk to somebody who can you know, who can really ask the underlying questions. If we get away from the surface conversations, it's fascinating. So I'm going to give you an example. I have a friend of mine who, we were talking about abortion, um, just to keep it light. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was about I'm to say. I'm going to dive, dive I mean, in. we're just going real deep just right going now. for it, yeah. Um, but it was funny because I I couldn't believe it. He's He he lives in California, and and he was like, and I was like, well, you know, I'm 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 pro-choice, and, and, um, and I can't remember the context that it was coming up with. And he said, well, the, the thing I'm struggling with is I'm a parent and I just feel like I don't know. For me, it's less about like a woman's choice, a man's choice. It's about when does life begin? And I thought, oh, God. Well, that, that was the key question in Roe v. Wade. Right. Sure. Yeah. But like, that's not what anybody's talking about right now. Right. And I'm not saying, by the way, that I changed my perspective. Right, right, right. But what I did in that moment was I understood <laughs> his perspective. And, and that was really cool because here's somebody who sees a situation very differently than I do. I maybe didn't need to go, oh, now I, I come to his side. It wasn't about him trying to convince me. But I went, I, I can understand why you would have your perspective. And, and I thought like... You may have a different belief and that doesn't necessarily make you evil. Right. right. I, don't not, need, I don't need to go hate you and think you're now right. the enemy. And, and what, this is what, this is, what yeah. caused that? What I mean, because I, I mean, I remember a time where social media didn't exist, obviously, but that's made it easier to hear and see other people's so opinions, Fox, yeah, right? Yeah. But was there a time? I mean, I don't remember where there was more. I guess discourse would be the right word. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, was there that time? Well, yes. I think I, I I would say yes. And why? Um, and how can we get back to that point? Or can we even get back to that yeah. point? Several. So I wrote a blog entry that actually teases, you know, on a bunch of the stuff. So one thing we also did that we didn't talk about too is over this period of time, we've also built a family office, uh, which we call Naco3. That's right. And so uh, people can go to this, this website at Naco3, which is essentially the uh, chemical formula for baking soda, um, and check out our, our, the blog that I wrote, but it's around why America is so divided. But this is a very deep, complex topic that we're not going to do justice given the time we have left. But um, I will suffice it to say that money mechanics of how our democracy works and how they've changed over time and the media are the three big buckets um, with the intellectual regression in terms of openness to other ideas and, and sort of the willingness to explore other ideas at, at, at universities, you know, I think have been some of the really big factors. Um, we could get, I could go incredibly deep on this. Which is why I'm calling yeah, him off. So I was will. literally like, don't go <laughs> yeah. down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, that's a um, whole... Be, but I think it's because we care. So it's, this is why I say what's interesting is our philosophical exploration was, was together, right? We, we went down this, this journey of going, we're worried about, about the future and, and we're worried about the polarization. And so he's, he's helping to move the ball forward in a political way. And I feel like, you know, hopefully through the deep, I'm, I can help how people communicate and, and because we're never going to see things the same way. Look at a, you know, we are, the U S is vast, right? I am never going to see the world uh, the same way as maybe someone who lives in the middle of the country that grew up in a completely different set of circumstances than me. But if I can figure out how to 
to appreciate them and understand them and not villainize and hate them, we're in a better spot here. Well, and, and I think one question that everybody needs to ask themselves is, like in a diverse democracy uh, that represents over 300 million people, is it a reasonable expectation that we all agree? Of course not. Right. right? Well, that's why we have a federal system. That's why we have three branches of government. That's why there's all these different types of things to have it incrementally evolve over time. Right? I, so, I even think like the whole Republican Democrat thing is broken. Well, he, well it, it's just, like two. I'm to use one example about one this. Quick, so yeah, yeah, we yeah. Went, <laughs> yeah. I just opened the. Game. I know you just. I told totally <laughs> you did. So we went to listen to Howard Schultz chat, and I, I, I yeah. thought this was a really important um, uh, moment. We were talking with him, and he said, "You know, we're talking to him about immigration," and he mm -hmm. said, "Well, you know, I looked at what." Um, Bush's Bush, and Bush and Obama proposed for immigration, and he said they're they were almost identical, and and he's like, and neither of them could get them through, because neither party wanted to give the other party a political victory. Mm. Who we suffers? Have, American people suffer. Right. We have when lost sight of politics. what matters. Mm -hmm. That is what that says to me. And so they're more interested on demonizing the other than solving. Well, problems. it's a label you're putting on something, and that obviously creates all that divide. Right. And right. Well, just so what? here's a stat that proves this. So. 40 years ago, on the survey that asked the average American family, would you allow somebody in your family to marry somebody of the opposing political party? Only 5% of the country said no. 5% are Republicans, 5% Democrats. Now it's over 50%. Politics is the new prejudice. If you tell somebody, oh, I'm on team red or I'm on team blue, right? instantly people judge you, have a label, and have a bunch of assumptions about what you believe and, and whatnot. And you instantly shut down communication mm -hmm. right? and curiosity and exploration, which is absurd. It, and that's because both of these groups have systematically spent the last several decades, one, preventing political competition by changing the rules to rig the game in their advantage. They agree on the duopoly. It, uh, two, continuing to demonize the other through mass, massive negative campaigns and spending lots of money and all this. And so it, uh, they're largely more defined on not being the other yeah. than they are about what they actually stand for. right? And then, of course, to her point around playing politics rather than solving problems, Americans are suffering, right? And everybody knows that the government's not representing them. It's not working. And so people are really pissed off. And now there's, that's why they're turning to, you know, populist style candidates like Trump. But, you know. And this happened kind of quick. So I will say there's hope here. And this is why I, I get excited about the deep. Because to me, I think what happened is you had a shift in media and, and you had this, this, this popularization of, of polarization, right? Suddenly we were willing to listen to people spew rhetoric from the far left and the far right in a way we would have never like heard of before. And and one thing I think that's possible is that so that just became culturally acceptable. I think that just as quickly as that could become culturally culturally acceptable, we could we could change that and make people that are inquisitive, that ask good questions, that are willing to be open-minded, that feel thoughtful and considerate about um, the full big picture, could we make that what we what we lift up and what we, you know, sorry, yeah. No, no, just to play devil's advocate on that point, because I'm very passionate about politics too, and I won't get into that right now, because <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll go on forever. But don't you think, and I'll disagree with you just to play devil's advocate. Do it. The people that ask questions, right, like, you know, the inquisitive minds, the people that have yeah. more experiences, that question things, that understand things a little bit differently, you know, I'll, I'll throw an example like AOC, right? And yeah. I'm, I think there comes a point where it's She not, plays League of Legends, by the way. <laughs> Does she? Okay. Yeah. So I'll try to not speak too <laughs> ill of her. Uh, but she asks questions, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't necessarily call her somebody that can execute on or find the answers to those questions, right? right? Where is that? Where, where, how can we, you know, create the conversation or find the people that are both asking the questions but are also curious and can get the answers and do something about it. Because asking questions and tearing down and you know tearing down Trump's presidency or whatever, right. it's very easy. It's not right. that hard. I mean, anybody could do it. But how do you build back up, you know, um, and then have a meaningful discourse, right? Not just a discourse, but like a meaningful conversation, meaningful engagement. Yeah, I mean, this is what I, my hope is that that's what the deep will help train. Right. So, and and I, I think that, one thing that's been interesting, I had a dinner party and we, we, we tackled a deep topic. People left here and said, and I'm, I'm patting our back here, um, uh, but the, uh, the co-founder of the deep, Kate and I hosted this and um, people walked away and were like, that was the best dinner party I'd ever been at. We had people of all different political persuasions, different races, different genders, and it was 
fascinating because we all got in a room and we hit on, we got, the topic was the meaning, it was uh, sanctity of life. Like, are some people more, like... Are some lives worth more than others. Worth yeah, more than others. Yeah, you guys have posted this on Instagram. Yeah, right? keeping it really light, obviously, yeah, in a dinner exactly. party. Yeah. But we were like, look, we can't be afraid of this. We're going to sit down, and there's rules. The rules are, your questions are to seek to understand, not to convince somebody that you're right. You're not right. There's not a right answer. When I run a business, there's actually not always a right answer either. What, what a business leader, what, a, what to me, what a leader of this country should seek to do is seek to understand the situation the very best they can and do the best job they can with the information that they have. There is not a right answer. And I think when we start to understand that, you know, that there isn't one, and that it's nuanced, and that the, the smartest people ask good questions, I mean, that's really exciting to me. And, and so when you're saying, you know, it, it's easy to tear people down, that's exactly my problem is it's so easy to point fingers. Um, and I think you'll see this with like the younger, younger people will always go, oh, my boss sucks. This person sucks. They're ruining my life. And the second they are that boss, their empathy level increases massively because they understand, oh my gosh, this is not what I thought it was. You know, there's not like a, a playbook for this. So again, that empathy thing I think is, is really big. I, I don't have the answer for how to right, solve right. this problem. My hope is just that, hey, could we have more thoughtful, um, empathetic, kind conversations and understand issues without just reading a headline and, and jumping down other people's throat? Well, and just to add to that, I think one of the, the frameworks that can be useful in helping something be more right than something else is to constrain it from being this universal question, right? So the way that we do that at Riot as a company, as an example, is, is our mission, right? Well, we aspire to be the most player-focused game company in the world. So therefore, our guiding compass, North Star, is, well, what's best for our player? Well, that goes to, well, let's define, well, who is our player, right? right? And do we have a clear understanding of that, right? And so I think one of the main missed opportunities in a lot of the discourse in the country is, well, what does it mean to be American? Yes. Right. Like, let's go back to the fundamentals and let's philosophically explore and talk about what are we trying to do here? Right. Are we trying to say that there is one ideological correct way to live and we therefore want to expect everyone else to conform to the correct way to do things? Or do we think that different groups of people that have different backgrounds and perspectives and live, you know, like Alabama may want to have a bit of a different legal framework for certain behaviors than California? Is that okay or not? You know, I think you can orient things by certain frameworks. And this goes to what's the structure. And so this goes to how do we get out of this mess? We have to change the rules of the game. And this is where system thinking is so helpful. You know, I think, unfortunately, it's nigh impossible for real political competition to unseat Republicans and Democrats currently with the way that the laws are written. Mm -hmm. um, relating to closed primaries versus open primaries, relating to the first past the post voting system. So fortunately, now there, we've gotten ranked choice voting passed in Maine. Uh, I can talk about what that is. We've gotten it passed in New York City. Um, every single successful movement in this country, whether it's women's suffrage, whether it's gay rights, whether it's marijuana reform, et cetera, started at the state and municipality level and then ultimately scaled to the federal level. So what we're trying to do in the democracy reform movement, essentially, is help reduce corruption, help eliminate corruption by following the money, highlighting where it's happening. Because one another appropriate, the thing that Trump and Bernie agree on, right, and that both of their followers agree on, essentially, is that the game is rigged and the swamp needs to be drained. And, and, and that, because that's actually true. Yeah. The, and so, essentially, the politicians have great incentive to focus on what the donors want, right, which are single interest groups, unions, big businesses, wealthy people, et cetera, rather than voters, we can change the structure to make that different, where all of a sudden politicians have more incentives to focus on voters. If that happens, and then also you have a system where rather than just choosing one person you have to vote for, you know, in the first pass the vote system, you can actually rank people. So rather than being like, you know what, I don't want to waste my vote and go for the outside candidate that I think may not have a chance to win, even I'm if not, I think they're better even for if the job. I think job. they're better. I'm not going to vote for them because I don't want to waste my vote. I'm going to be able to vote for this person because all my all these votes are going to count. Look up ranked choice voting. I'm not going to do justice in the explanation here. Um, all of a sudden, different ideas, different candidates right. have a chance of winning, right? And so it if would, we, if it we would change, immediately pull people who are 
extreme because Extremist, they're only yeah. trying to appeal to their base, mm-hmm. they have to now speak to the whole country, right. which would change the rhetoric overnight. Right. So AOC, yeah. as an example, you mentioned her, she won 16,000 votes in her district, right? Now she has 3 million Twitter followers. You know, um, that's because controversies, you know, it, it sells, whereas she wouldn't win in a situation that actually had a democratic process that reflected the will of the majority mm-hmm. of the district, right? And so... Well, she, she I don't know, right? Don't know. We're just saying, oh, might sorry, have right. win. Unlikely, right, too, right? Because 3% of the vote, or, you know, like, participate in the primary, it tends to skew very hardcore. It's been gerrymandered so much that it's 70% blue. You know, so by essentially because politicians are picking their voters and rigging the rules to their advantage, right? It's not a fair system that's actually has anything to do with what the average American wants. If we change that, right? If the government starts to function over time to actually do a better job of solving problems for people rather than playing these political games that Republicans and Democrats both are constantly focused on, you know, for political gain, again, rather than solving problems, I think we can unlock an incredible amount of potential. And uh, anyway, there was a Wall Street Journal article that just came out recently that talked about some of the parallels of this time with the pre-Renaissance era, where the, uh, and essentially one of the, the ways to optimistically look at this negative discourse, the polarization, the Tower of Babel, where social media noise is crazy, where controversy is selling, you know, and facts don't matter, is that will hopefully, to Ash's point, give rise to valuing discourse, valuing curiosity, valuing discussion. And lots of entrepreneurs and different organizations and different people are going are gonna to get involved to come forward to help improve the situation, which may yield incredible positive benefits for humanity and for our democracy that we've yet to ever see. Right. Right? And so that's the, that's the glass half full mm-hmm. right. view. Um, and so, and it's because I do believe necessity is mother of invention, when things get really bad, the good thing about humans is we tend to step up to fill the void. And that's one of the things that I believe about America, right, is, you know, I have a bias that I think that that, like America is a country where it's the land of the free, which means we have a responsibility and an obligation to get involved to help, mm. right? It's not someone else's problem. We right. can't rely on the government to come in and, you know, someone else to come swoop in. It's like, well, what are we going to do? This right. is our country. Right. Right. And again, I think John F. Kennedy said it best. Yes. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Right. And I think that that mindset is very, very important. And a lot of people may rant on social media, right. And not necessarily go get involved. If you want to get involved, one of the best things you could possibly do is go reduce corruption. Mm. 96% of Americans agree corruption is bad. Right. right? So guess what? Represent us. Represent us. 4% should be like, they yeah, should leave but, the country. But is the number one anti corruption organization in the country it's nonpartisan, right and so get if you want to go get involved and actually help move the needle right go get involved in reducing corruption yeah i agree i'm curious um what is like how do you see what's the vision for the deep and how do you see it scaling because obviously we talk a lot about these you know big things and um i think at the core of it is democracy because yeah. otherwise you know you have these entities that control the narratives control this stuff so how do you how how is what is your vision for the deep um in terms of like the, the content and like even the topics that you're um, yeah. putting out there and then how do you see people um kind of engaging with that community like do you see them throwing their own dinners and house parties against uh, yeah, yeah i think i think um uh, so this is the first time I've ever launched anything in this way. Uh, Mark and I were just talking about this, which was, um, you know, normally I, I have a clear business plan. I understand how, um, y- you know, how it's going to be self-sufficient entity. I understand all these things. This one... Not uh, totally true since Lunia just kind of launched. Right, right. Well, it did kind of have a bit of an accidental plan, launch. Yeah, but yeah, I had a very clear a plan. plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so the deep is interesting because um, I think I felt a really strong call to action around seeing um, a shift in discourse. And and frankly, not just for others, for my, myself. I felt like, God, I'm having all these surface level conversations with people. I'm not really interested in that. And and how do I change the kind of dialogues that we, we have with each other? How do we be unafraid to, to really get in there with someone? And, and um, so I had a very strong sort of personal desire to do this. Um, the other reason, you know, I mentioned that one conversation with my friend that I had about abortion. The other thing that I started doing was uh, I would wake up very early and I would read a lot of news articles and I would underline them and then I would be like, you know, what is the underlying question that this is really talking about? You know, I, I remember there was one, this was at a time where one politician was being told, uh, I 
this was like when he, the, the, the blackface scandal, you know, he sort of dressed in, in, in that um, uh, when he was younger, and then they were saying, oh, he should step down for politics. And so, uh, and then simultaneously, um, this guy who had uh, um, murdered somebody was running for office. He happened to be African American, and, um, and people were up applauding him. And I thought, this is so interesting. Yeah. I, now, not without saying an opinion on it, I thought, what this is asking is, do we believe in redemption? Do we believe people can make a mistake and then we still can have hope for them that they can do something positive? And so when you look at these two things together, um, you know, it, it actually, it, again, back to empathy, right? And so I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And so people were responding. I was doing this on Instagram yeah. and people were like, wow, thank goodness you're reading the news because I don't yeah. like to read the news and thanks for like the Cliff Notes version. You're making me think about this in a different way. And so I went, there's something here. It's not that people don't want to think about it. It's like almost... I have to tee it up for them to help make it easier to think about it. And so when you ask where it's going, I would say it's an evolving um, entity. I think, I think the obvious answer is that we're going to gamify this thing, right, Mark? <laughs> well, what I, what I would we say We are going to tweak the rules yeah. to lead to different outcomes. <laughs> yeah. Because yes. the, the outcomes we're seeing are the outcomes that the structure has been created to achieve. Right. Yeah. So the, the one thing I will say is I kind of summarize it as it's almost like the way Skim made news accessible to like 8 million people that follow the Skim, I think making philosophy accessible and fun for people would be a huge win. And I so love that because I feel like there's a lot of people out there, myself included, that don't want to have surface level conversations with exactly. a lot of people where it's like, and then it's like, oh, I mean, you're not interested. You're not like, you're not interested in being here. Right. But it's not that it's like if we were having a, a much more philosophical conversation and right. look, there's a time and place for it. But I think that you get, you know, you get to a certain yeah. place where you want to just have those conversations. Well, there's a huge gap, right? Because <laughs> yeah. the daily news media, right. right, is a popcorn tabloidization, you know, gossip column, such and such said something about somebody else, you know, just a bunch of nonsense that gets parroted where facts don't matter and there's no diligence. Everybody only reads the headlines. And right. so I thought, you know, we have to become critical thinkers. Freedom is actually a huge responsibility. Right. And imagine when deep fakes show up, right, which are videos. Yeah. You know, and so one of the yeah. things, again, that's a controversial optimistic perspective around deep fakes is... Yeah. I actually look forward to them becoming so common that they have like an Instagram app where you can have your friends, uh, you know, become like make it look like there's like they did something or saying something that they actually didn't do. Because then the average person's going to empathize with what happens with this media nonsense that occurs right, right now, where you know people get slandered, you know, where without real diligence or real facts or whatnot. And nobody cares. Damage is done simply because headline gets repeated, you know, right. over and Speaking over. Speaking of headlines, I got a fake email uh, the other day. Um, it was like one of those like job things where it's like, hey, we have a job for you. It's going to pay like a million dollars or whatever. You know, one of the, yeah. one of those things. Like, so I screenshotted it. I put it on Instagram and I said, just found the job of my dreams, like something like that with like a rocket emoji. And the amount of DMs that I got just congratulating me for finding the job of my dreams. I was like, are you? Do you even read like what's happening? Like how fake this is? Like I didn't. I didn't wow. think I had to actually say it was fake. But uh, I don't think anyone's ever congratulated me that much for something. So it's pretty funny. <laughs> That's funny. Mark, you brought up a point earlier that I think ties into this. And I'm just curious, was money, right? Like money in politics, you know, Citizens yeah. United and that whole issue, which I think is really the core of a lot of the other problems. But going back to just, you know, I think money is important. How do you monetize this? Because at the end of the day, oh, I with do, the deep? With the deep or just deep thought or philosophy in general because I think that people do want to have the conversations right yeah. like when Pat and I are hanging out or we're hanging out with friends we have those conversations because I mean we're past the service yeah. area but with just people that you don't know right with the right. rest of the world how do you incentivize people to have these conversations I, I think people want to have these conversations I think they don't know how or they're so busy. You know, look, here we're talking about an America where most families have two working parents. They've got kids. They're, they're so busy. When are they going to have the time to ponder these sorts of thoughts? That's why they can't read beyond the headline. Well, it's, mm. they just don't have the bandwidth for it. So to right. me, what I'm trying to do is actually help. If you go under our Instagram, you don't have to come up with these questions. They're there for you. Mm. My hope is, and I've had people come to me and be like, I went to a dinner party and I basically just read the meaning of life questions. We spent two hours talking about it. This was amazing. And so they're out there. To That's that's my gift to the world in that I'm, I'm trying to help 
that happen. It's a facilitating um, entity. Now, when you talk about monetization, this is the first time I haven't created something with that being the primary focus. Right. I'm not saying I believe, because I'm sort of an, I have a weird take on philanthropy in that the problem with philanthropy, honestly, is while it's incredibly important, you have to become a professional beggar. You have to constantly yeah. be asking for more money. And when the mood changes, when whatever's popular, a focus of philanthropy, you're in big trouble. So I do believe that good things, ideally you build them to be self-sustaining. Right. I am not looking to become like massively wealthy off the day. Right, that right. is never, I didn't build it that way. And, and so from my standpoint, what I'm hoping is, yes, I'd like to build something that's self-sustaining and that can grow, but I'm really just hoping I build something that people really connect with and helps enrich their life. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we can go on and on and on and on and on, but just to wrap things up, Mark, I'll start with you and Ashley, you know, we'll finish it off with you. What, what's coming up for you? I know you talk a lot about politics. Is there any sort of aspirations to get involved purely in politics and kind of let go of business? Or is it something that you just kind of see that is your responsibility and it's tied into what you're doing now with business? So for me, it's really about giving back and it's sort of a service, a call to serve. Um, you know, I fundamentally believe in, you know, the leadership is a service role. Um, you know, I'm an Eagle Scout as an example. And so, you know, I, I want to find ways to give back. I tend to be motivated by big, audacious problems, uh, as well as like high level systems problems and, and impact. And so, uh, like what to me, one thing is really exciting therefore is being like, Hey, if I can help change the structure of how our system works to lead to better outcomes for all of our citizens, that's a good thing. That's motivating for me. Um, but, you know, I, while I'm spending less time, uh, you know, and I'm not operating the day-to-day, -day, you know, at Riot, um, I love games. I'm still involved. Uh, you know, I think our, the future is incredibly bright, you know, for the company. You know, but, I, but I'm, I'm going to be figuring out what my next chapter looks like. I think there's some ambiguity. I'm spending a lot more time with family, spending a lot of time, you know, trying to support Ash and, you know, and her aspirations and whatnot. And that's something that's really exciting to me. I think I find myself that I'm growing in ways that I uh, have probably neglected for, you know, too long. And so, um, so that's, that's what I'm doing. And so, you know, but this is the long play where, you know, the yield will be deferred. And so, you know, again, I'm, I'm 39. I have the luxury of, trying to help the world be better over the long term. Uh, because I think that no matter what candidate wins in the short term and these types of things, this is all, it's not, these are like, those are, it's, it's band-aids and it's symptoms. The, the outcomes we're seeing right now are symptoms of much deeper problems. So we need people to go focus on these deeper problems and building entities that people can unify behind or channel resources to that can continue to attack these areas to me is very meaningful. Uh, but I have zero aspirations to go into politics myself. I think the downside is incredibly large. Um, and also, I am too fair. Like, I, I literally, I, I, am, I think I'm too ethical. Like, I play by the rules. And there's a bunch of people that clearly don't. And that would be massively to my disadvantage. Um, Do you think a lot of these problems can be solved through business and not politics? I think it can be solved through entrepreneurship. I think, and which is much more of a mindset. I think I can manifest in lots of different ways, but I think part of it, it's like we need actual, like good politicians, good leaders in government. We need organizations. We need nonprofits. We need a whole plethora of different vectors of attack. Um, we need media to get their act together also, because I have, an I have developed an incredible disdain for the, the, the news media um, because of how, like, you know, I've, I've just had so many negative experiences where I'm shocked at the lack of thoughtfulness, the lack of diligence, the lack of research, and the printing of things that are fundamentally incorrect. You know, Mark Twain has a quote, you know, where he says, uh, if you read the news, or if you don't read the news, you're uninformed. If you read the news, you're misinformed. And that is, in my experience, so utterly yeah. true. This is one of the things we, we have a friend um, Jarl Mohn, who, who jumped in to help um, NPR. And I think I admire him so much for that because he was retired, like could just be chilling. He'd run 
business all his life and founded E Entertainment. Yeah, and I mm. think he recognized he's, he's the CEO of NPR just recently. Yeah, mm. how important how important NBR is, you yeah. know, and to, and, and so I'm, I look at someone like him and think, you know, wow, what an incredible contribution. Right. Thank you for your service, Jarl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. NPR definitely is in the, one of the best positions to really transform this whole like narrative of like news and consumers whether it's like, yeah. like, sorry, whether it's like big news or like podcasts even and all, all that kind of stuff. But, but, but people, it's funny though, because when, when media is a business, and this is where business is tricky, you yeah. know, and we're business people, so I'm saying this as, as a pro-business person, but is it's all about aligned incentives. Right. And so ultimately, in today's world, what media needs is clicks and eyeballs. And if the consumers are just consuming garbage and giving the clicks and eyeballs and shares to garbage because they're not reading deep or they're not holding media to higher standards, then we're That's actually, what gonna get. yeah, you're, you're creating you're a self-perpetuating system of of, of garbage. And so I think that there's, there's also this sort of sense of responsibility. Again, we like to blame everybody else for everything being wrong, but I look at that and go, I think we have responsibility as consumers. I think of news, of environmental, you know, uh, protection and this kind of thing. And, and in politics and in so many ways, I think we have to like, say freedom is a responsibility and yeah. we need to really step into that at a different level. Riot's owned by a Chinese company. Right. Right. And so mm -hmm. we can look not too far across the Pacific Ocean to a or country that does things a little differently in terms mm -hmm. of how they regard, you know, regard media, right? And, um, you know, we used to have the Fairness Doctrine, you know, in the, in the late 80s, which essentially was an FCC rule which required that news organizations and, you know, on broadcast TV, you know, report both sides and report objective facts and things like that. And one of the interesting things is, granted, there was no, this is pre-internet, this is pre the rise of cable channels and sort of the, the confirmation bias of just catering to a niche audience that wants to hear the stuff you want to spew. But the country was much more unified, right? This was a time when Congress had a lot of bipartisan bills and, you know, uh, whether you were on the you know, Republican or Democrat, you know, people could still agree on most things, which actually, by the way, is still true. Most Americans still agree on most things, uh, but it's not represented that way. You know, in right. by, by the know parties, that, right? you know, or by the media. But when you go actually talk to people and you connect face to face right. and you actually talk about issues or whatnot, or you get to know people, we have so much in common. A lot of people don't want to talk about their politics on social but media. See, and this sure. is this is where I'm I'm yeah. worried, and this is why I, I like the deep, and I don't yeah. I'm not gonna because I'm not gonna attack. shy away yeah, from, exactly. and it feels exactly. bad to get attacked. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think we can shy away from those important topics because. That is very scary. Also. Well, it's, it's going to make people feel like people have to feel com comfortable with that conflict because it's going to create conflict. Well, think about every situation, if you think about our history, where people stopped speaking out mm -hmm. and how dangerous that has been. Yeah. And so to me, you create an environment where we shame people for having different points of view and they don't talk. And then we allow bad things to happen. We 100%. are easy to kind of... We're sheep, and we can get herded in the wrong direction. I think the question was, "What's coming next?" So I don't know if if you've already answered it, but anything else you wanted to? Um, you add? know, I I, uh, I don't have like a, a next hit list item. Like, oh, this is the next yeah. mountain I want to climb. So I would actually almost make it very like personally a thing I'm trying to work on is um, is. Uh, to get out of that grind mode, enjoy this amazing life that we have before my kids get too old mm -hmm. and um, and don't want to hang out with me anymore and um, and cultivate this relationship with my husband. So what I'm really working on for the near future is how do I do the things that I love professionally um, and manage to find more balance in my life? You guys are one of our earliest guests in the new decade. So... What are or what is one bold prediction that you have for the 2020s? It could be about anything, mm -hmm. anyone, anywhere. So, I mean, to I guess I've referenced this a little bit relating to deep fakes, but um, I am optimistic that by the end of the 2020s, you know, we're we're going to hit, we're going to have some major catastrophes that, unfortunately, I think occur in the 2020s i think there's one happening as we record this podcast uh, with iran but oh, iran, that one too. australia yeah so right so um you know i like to look at the world sometimes from a game mechanics perspective in civilization six a very famous franchise there is a technology tree right and then there's also a civics tree about you know which relate to different points you can accumulate over time that represent some progress and uh, tech relates to science and knowledge you know, things like the alphabet that's discovering the wheel, agriculture, et cetera. Civics relates to governance. Like, can we collaborate more effectively, communicate, 
uh, you know, different innovations of like monarchy or things like that. I think that, you know, we know that our tech tree for humanity is skyrocketing. The technology gain is exponential. One of the challenges of that is the cost of change for the technology is massive. Like there's going to be more disruption coming from AI, you know, self-driving cars, biotech, all these crazy things. It's going to have massive cultural change that's going to make the industrial revolution look tame by comparison. And but because we have bad governance that tends to be reactive rather than being a little proactive to help mitigate the impact of these different types of things, I think there's going to be massive social strife and different challenges. One of the benefits, though, or arguments is, again, I think that the saving grace will be business, the saving grace will be entrepreneurs, the saving grace will be individuals, not big institutions, that go help find ways to mitigate the damage for these things. And again, like one, to use the deep fakes example, as deep fakes become more democratized and everybody gets access to, to feeling how bad it is, when somebody totally misrepresents morale, you know, reality to make you look horrible, um, that will hopefully rebound with a rise in critical thinking, a rise in quality, a rise in uh, facts, a rise in different media solutions and whatnot around what is real, which I think will have a great benefit for the rest of the 21st century. And to that point, I think um, when it comes to like these founders and entrepreneurs of the next, you know, um, 10, 20 years, um, they also have to get creative with it because these are problems that don't have clear business plan, business models. So right. it's always, it's always like you mentioned, Ashley, like it's like those things where it's like not, it's not very clear, like how you could monetize something. But I, I, I don't know if it's something as a society that we need to be okay with where, you know, I mean, the, the for-profit business is, it can't just be a for-profit business anymore. Right. It has to be more than that. So, well, And to that point, I think another thing we're going to see is NACO 3, so our family office, it's kind of foundation, kind of, you know, investment arm. It's, just, you know, kind of, it's, it's, I think a lot of other foundations are going to evolve in this way. And so to any entrepreneurs out there that want, that think that they have a way to go solve a meaningful problem for humanity and don't necessarily have the right business model for it or whatever, well, we actually want to talk to you. Right? Because we are fundamentally motivated to try to go fund, invest, support mm. things that are going to really help the world. It's like social entrepreneurship is going to be on the rise. Right. For sure. And again, not just from the perspective of nonprofits right, or right, right. B Corps or whatnot. Right. Totally. Right. I think so too. Um, I, I hate to say this because this is so doomsday. I, I, the only thing I feel sure of is that we're going to have a rough decade. And I think particularly would go, yes, on the political side, but I'm very concerned environmentally. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, we're seeing extreme extreme weather. We're seeing, you know, fires are becoming a very common occurrence here in Southern California. And, and I feel like um, things will have to get pretty bad before we're really, really willing to inconvenience ourselves on a mass level. And it really, it's, it's disappointing to me, but I'm also going to say I'm guilty of it, right? I, yeah. I drive my car to work. I was, I just was putting on Instagram today that I hate that I go to the grocery store and, I, you know, I want to buy berries and they're in a, a plastic container, yeah. which I know, I mean, do you know, we, we've stopped with recycling programs in a lot of different places. So I'm looking at this going, you know, oh man, how bad are things going to have to get yep. before we're really willing to make a change? And I don't know the answer, but I think certainly in this 10-year window, we're going to see s some more of that. Right. And yeah. everyone's saying, hey, government, come solve the problems. The government isn't going to solve these problems. Right. They're not capable of doing much of anything. Right. Yeah. right? And so, like, but you're, you're the same person that doesn't want to get taxed more because that well, tax money is going to go, go yeah. Well, no, it's not to say <laughs> that the government doesn't do incredible things and hasn't done incredible things. They have, right? And it's really important. Infrastructure, right? Or, like, I could go on and on about the importance of the, even say our military or federal banks or the world bank, all sorts of different great institutions that exist. But for new problems, right, we're not staying ahead of the curve. The only way to stay ahead of the curve is I fundamentally believe through entrepreneurship. I mean, I think like Elon Musk and not to be so like, like stereotypical here, but let's look at it. I mean, I want to drive an, an electric car. It, I also want to drive a cool car. Okay. Tesla is like the first person. They've actually had this technology to make cars like this for years. Why is he the first person to really make a, a, a car that can be cool to drive, effective, environmentally you know, friendly? Well, it, it, to me, that's such an opportunity. There's probably a million more businesses like this. Please, if someone wants to start a business where they can turn all those 
plastic packages that hold my fruit and, and put into something better, great. You know, I pay more for that. Mm. There's a business opportunity there. We recently funded, uh, helped fund a company called Lollyware, um, mm. this awesome female founder who is using seaweed to make straws and plastic replacements. It's amazing because seaweed is a really great renewable resource. Yeah. And it's, it actually, and like a paper straw, which like decomposes while you drink, it, it's a game changer. So to me, I'm like, that is entrepreneurial opportunity. Yeah. Right. It seems like what's happening, like you said, um, is it's gotta be, it's gotta get really bad and to, to the point where everyone is like all hands on deck yes. on like, you know, when businesses start making the decisions to have like the seaweed straws and not the plastic ones. Right. And, and, you know, it's kind of like, it has to kind of trickle down that way. Otherwise, yes. you know, obviously consumer behavior matters too. And it's kind of this both sides of the coin thing where like there's the businesses and then there's the consumers and both both have to be on the same page otherwise. Right. Well, they in SpaceX, to, like work. all the government would do anyway is aggregate some money that they're taking from different people to then fund particular areas. They still need entrepreneurs to go take that money and go do something with it. Right. Yep. Right. I mean, so SpaceX reduced the cost of putting a satellite in space by, you know, 95%, right? They do it at 120th the cost, right, of what, for, compared to NASA. Thank you, right, mm-hmm. for driving that innovation, right, when nobody said you could and it was impossible and yada, yada, right? I mean, that type of thing happens all the time. And so, but that's about... Humans. That's about yeah. individuals. That's about small teams. And you know, and it's, I, but it's sad to see like he's still under fire. Like even for Tesla, like obviously you know t- earnings and this and that. It didn't hit earnings. Like but look what he's doing. Yeah. You know, and 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 that's what we need to be start getting like at, right. you know as I mean, a society. I just moved our company into biodegradable bags. It was so hard to find somebody that would sell biodegradable bags. But you look at this and go like in every step of the way, as we are consumers are going to become more aware, and there is so much opportunity there for some well, people can make money. And doing that's something it. that business leaders can actually do, right? When you have supplier power, as an example, right? Like so, Riot doesn't have that many suppliers, but you know because we do a lot of things ourselves. Digital. But if we did, yeah. right, and we're digital, you know, but it's like. You can go demand change in your supply chain, right? And so, like, I would love to see, and, you know, Ash likes to talk about Amazon as an example and, you know, would say, like, hey, would love to see the amount of good they can do in the world if they would actually move more in the direction of helping to drive some more sustainability or whatnot. So at one of the deep dinner parties, actually, uh, one of our, the, uh, the guys that joined us, he was like, you know, why doesn't Amazon rebuild the Amazon? Okay. You guys... So Why? We, this we, is insane. We, so we have an episode. We have this segment called After Hours, where him and I just talk, and we make fake shit up. So like yeah. we're part of the fake news culture too. Sometimes, but we say that we're fake. Yeah, you disclose yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, we disclose it early. We say it before we actually say the whole story. So one of our, I think the second one was that Jeff Bezos bought the Amazon. But you know, like Amazon bought the Amazon and made this this entire like city and it's booming and it became but it's like this channel of like distribution. He could, he could do yeah. it, and you know what's funny is yeah. like there's probably yeah. nothing. Yeah, but he's busy like, cheating with other women. But there's oh. nothing more on brand for Amazon <laughs> yeah, yeah. than to support the Amazon, and they yeah. could that would make a huge difference yeah. from an environmental standpoint. Yeah. So it's funny because yeah. if enough consumers would get out there, let's let's create a hashtag Amazon for Amazon or whatever it is. Yeah. But it's like if enough consumers got out there and demanded it. And then, you know, th- that could actually create change and power. Well, and business leaders, though, they do have a responsibility, right? And I think should think differently. If, like the, the, the whole Milton Friedman concept of the, of the 20th century around maximizing shareholder value as being the one goal of business is freaking stupid. Yeah. You know, like you need to think about shared value. The way we've always thought about it, right, is you need to create an incredible organization where the best people can go to work who then want to fulfill and create incredible value for, you know, the audience you're trying to serve, and if by doing that, you're going to create shareholder value, right? And so that's an outcome. We look at revenue as a trailing indicator, right? The upstream things are, are we doing a great job of serving our community? You know, and one of the responsibilities there is, well, our community wants to do good, right? So we've created all sorts of different opportunities over time for them to channel their dollars to different causes around the world. You know, and we've sort of baked that into the organization with our whole karma arm as we call it which is essentially like an an, you know a a robust philanthropy program and we did that as a startup right like there's a and now it's you know much larger and scaling we can do it all over the world but i think that there's a great opportunity for business leaders to continue to step up and drive a lot of positive change and i think a lot do Um, and i'd love to see the media cover those things right rather than constantly trying to tear down organizations which are largely creating the future at the LA Times didn't even send anybody, you know, to our world championships at the, you know, that we had at Staples Center 
twice, you know, 2013 and then 2016 or whatnot. It's like, oh, is that not, is that not relevant? Right. Like, like for Los Angeles, for right? Los Angeles, right. Or is it, you know, I mean, it was just, it just, it just was mind boggling to me. Right. It's like, it's hard to relate to. And I guess it's a, they have, and it's like, well, who, is it a tech reporter? They don't have a games reporter. Is it a sports reporter? Like they don't have the organization. Why not structure. just send all of it? And, right. But that's the thing. It's like, figure it out. Right. right? right. So right. anyway. It, yeah. And rant. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can't thank you guys enough for obviously spending time with us and for the work that you're doing both, you know, in the business world, both in the communities that you guys serve. And I mean, there's no doubt that there's more that is to come. And I think that for those that are listening and have been listening this whole time, there's a lot of takeaways. Um, and I think that although there might be a rocky decade from what we Lena and I kind of agree, there's a lot of opportunity that's going to come out yeah. of that. Right. right. So sure. I think that, you know, Embrace the negative stuff that's going to happen, yeah. but also just focus on building something positive. And I think that those that do are going to be the real winners in the 2030s. Yeah, I agree. So, um, totally agree. I agree. So thank you guys again for your time and opening your, up your house to us. And This has been so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, you guys. Yeah. yeah Doing good an to see interview you. in Lunia in my home is like my dream come true. <laughs> well, can't wait to do it again sometime. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Absolutely. You make me happy when skies are gray. You never know, do you, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. The end. Yeah, yeah, yeah.